Conjuring up images of the outdoors will often bring forth pictures of rolling, green, grassy hills, colourful shrubs, massive, looming trees, and calm, glassy waters. But there is a certain amount of danger in the wilderness, even for those who are experienced and knowledgeable. In today's episode of Cold Case Detective, we'll be exploring three eerie, unexplained cases of missing hunters. But first, I want to thank Magellan TV for sponsoring today's episode. Whether you're a subscriber or first time viewer here on Cold Case Detective, you've probably got a love for true crime content. There are so many unsolved mysteries waiting to be heard, but it can be hard to know where to find those hidden marvels. A lot of times when you do find a batch of the newest documentaries, it's filled with the same topics and cold cases you've seen over and over again. Luckily, there's a brand new hotspot for all things true crime and other fascinating subjects where these worries don't exist. Magellan TV is a membership-based streaming platform fast on track to become the leaders of the medium, created by a brilliant group of filmmakers who acknowledge the passion, drive, and desires of die-hard cold case detectives. Their website consists of the most impressive library of true crime-related titles available on any streaming platform around, including Netflix. Magellan TV also loves to blend in other topics like science and history, but through the lens of true crime. And if you need a break from the criminal sphere, they also offer films and series based on subjects such as the paranormal, the supernatural, and the dark sides of the universe. The best part is they add new shows and other 24-7 ad-free content each week, so you can discover new stories every single day on whatever device you'd like to stream from. One documentary that made our jaws drop was The Family Who Vanished, a short documentary diving into a complex case of murder, deception, and the disappearance of two infant boys. It is the perfect blend of true crime and cold cases, diving into a mostly unheard of mystery, an important mission that we share at CCD. If you sign up today, you'll receive a one month free trial by clicking on the link in the description below. So go out and explore those unsolved stories and support Cold Case Detective at the same time. And now let's dive in to three unexplainable cases of missing hunters. Thomas Messick Sr. Wearing a camouflage jacket and matching overalls, and carrying his rifle and walkie-talkie, 82-year-old Thomas Messick Sr. was prepared for his annual hunting trip with his friends at the Lake George Wild Forest in the state of New York. The 72,000-acre woodland consists of charming waterfalls, crystal-clear pond water, and dense green forests. The group had taken a hunting trip to the forest every year without fail, and 2015 would be no exception. Although Thomas had only recently recovered from shingles, he was looking forward to the trip. An experienced woodsman and hunter, the 82-year-old did not let his poor hearing or bad back stop him from living his life. Thomas was also a US Army veteran, had lost one of his eyes in his early 20s, and been happily married for over 50 years. On November 15th of 2015, at around 10 a.m., the group arranged themselves in preparation for a drive. Along with Thomas, three older members of the group sat stationary in a line with less than 100 yards between them. The other members of the group attempted to force deer towards the static members. However, that day, there was very little wildlife present. Disheartened, the hunters decided to reconvene after waiting for some time for deer to show. However, when they gathered together again, they realized that something was amiss. Thomas Messick Sr. was gone. 
While the group yelled for the elderly man and fired shots, they also searched the area, concerned for their missing friend. At around 4.30 p.m., the hunters contacted the forest rangers. Four rangers helped the men search until midnight, after which the group stayed awake, honking their car horns and hoping Thomas would show up. But he never did. The next day, another search was conducted, this one consisting of about 13 professional search and rescue members and was extremely well organized. But despite their best efforts, the group found no trace of the 82-year-old. Eventually, a massive search, consisting of over 300 people, was launched. Dogs, drivers, and helicopters assisted in the hunt, and over 15 organizations were involved, including forest rangers, police canine units, and a team from the FBI. But once again, there was no sign of Thomas. His clothing, walkie-talkie, and gun have never been recovered. The weather was less than pleasant during some of these explorations, with heavy rain impeding the search efforts, but authorities used string to grid search the forest, making sure every single square of ground had been covered, and they made sure to check any swamps or bodies of water in the area. Sniffer dogs didn't appear to have picked up any scent trails, or at least not any successful ones. While the official search for Thomas ended in January of 2016, forest rangers continue to periodically search the area for any clues. In the summer of 2018, state police took scent dogs through portions of the area where Thomas vanished from, expecting perhaps to find a body. However, their efforts turned up no new leads. For online sleuths, there are two odd aspects to Thomas's case. The first is that the FBI became involved just four days after the 82-year-old vanished. His wife, Beverly, said the FBI told her, quote, something isn't right with his case, but they don't know what. Beverly fears that her husband fell victim to foul play. The other odd detail of the case is that one of his hunting companions heard a strange noise in the woods shortly before Thomas disappeared. The companion said, I heard a strange noise in the woods, but I didn't know what it was. Just a different noise from what I usually hear, you know? It'd be hard to explain, but it was different. Something different that I never heard before in the woods. I just can't say what it was, you know? This was up towards the hill, the top of the hill. In later interviews, this friend described the noise as being a snapping or crack sound. While the friend told authorities what he'd heard, they didn't appear to think much of it. On the back of this detail, online sleuths have suggested that perhaps Thomas was trapped under a tree that fell on him after he vanished. Others have suggested that maybe this sound was the crack of a wooden cover of an old mine shaft snapping. It's also been speculated that Thomas's disappearance is linked with the vanishing of a 68-year-old man named Fritz Drum, who vanished from his own 150-acre property in New York on November 24th of 2015. Sadly, it is widely believed that due to his poor health, Thomas passed away from heart problems or perhaps succumbed to the elements after he disappeared. Authorities don't think that Thomas would have gotten far given his age and decaying health, while friends and family think it's most likely that he passed away shortly after vanishing. Thomas's case is still unsolved. If you have any information about his disappearance, you can contact the New York State Police at 518-745-1035. David Lee Peltier. On November 3rd, 2018, 59-year-old David Lee Peltier headed out to the Namaji State Forest, east of Hinckley, Minnesota, with a group of friends. The 92,000-acre forest is filled with lush green vegetation, thick, dense woods, and an abundance of wildlife. It was a bright, sunny day, so the friends decided it would be a good day to do some hunting. Upon their arrival around lunchtime, Lee, along with a man named John Warner, who was one of the owners of the cabins in which the group was staying, headed over to a nearby pond. The pair then decided to split up, with the idea being that Lee would flush the deer out so that they would run towards John, who was higher up on the bank. Eventually, the group reconvened for lunch, 
but Lee didn't turn up. However, nobody thought much of this, as everyone assumed that the 59-year-old was trailing a deer. They grew concerned, however, when he didn't return to the cabins later that evening. Lee was an experienced outdoorsman, who often hunted duck and deer on his 100-acre family farm in Lake Elmo, but on this particular evening, he was not as well equipped as he perhaps could have been. He was dressed in camouflage trousers with a red sweatshirt and orange vest, and was not prepared for the cold weather. He was also not carrying any water, or a lighter, or a backpack, and had no compass or GPS system. This became worrisome when the weather eventually turned. It began raining, followed by snow. The temperature in the area suddenly dropped to minus six. It was a harsh night, and without any mobile phone reception, the group were unable to immediately alert authorities. Instead, they spent the night outdoors after building a huge bonfire. They listened for gunshots that might alert the group to Lee's whereabouts or let them know he was in trouble. The group stayed awake all night, straining to hear gunshots, but the gunshots never came. The following morning, the group searched for their missing fellow hunter but were unable to locate him, so they made the half hour drive to the nearest town until they got mobile phone reception. From there, they called the local authorities. Five officers from the Pine County Sheriff's Office and the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources arrived on the scene and began to assist with the search. They explored the area on foot and on ATVs until the sky grew dark. The next morning, the local community came together with friends and family to help look for the 59-year-old. According to Lee's son, the wet terrain in the area was treacherous and made it difficult to search. The land was dotted with bogs, marshlands, and swamps. He added that authorities often found lost people half a mile from where they were last seen, but his father was physically fit and likely covered a lot more ground than law enforcement was used to. Call records from AT&T show that Lee made three calls at 1.40 p.m. on November 3rd to his hunting companions. His phone didn't die until 5.30 a.m. the following morning. This, for some, has ruled out the idea that he simply fell into a body of water, as his phone would not have lasted as long as it did. Sadly, the calls did not go through due to the poor phone reception in the forest. Lee's children have suggested that perhaps their father climbed into a tree to try and get reception. This has led some to theorize that maybe he then fell and injured himself. One of his daughters said looking for their father was like a needle in a haystack, literally. Other ideas about what might have happened to Lee have been proposed by online sleuths, including that he had a heart attack, succumbed to the elements, or fell victim to a sinkhole. Others have noted how it is odd that scent dogs never picked up a trail and that there were no footprints or other signs that the 59-year-old had been in the area. His clothing has never been recovered. Neither has his phone or rifle. The Namaji State Forest is certainly a force to be reckoned with. Just a year earlier, in September of 2017, a 61-year-old hunter from Lakeville spent three nights lost in the area. He managed to survive on bog water until he was rescued. He was located because he was able to make a fire, which was picked up by infrared cameras on a passing search plane. Lee left behind nine grandchildren when he vanished in the forest that day of November 2018. In the years since, there has been little progress in his case. His children set up a GoFundMe shortly after his vanishing and raised $10,000 to help with the search efforts, but so far, their endeavors have been in vain. If you have any information about the disappearance of David Lee Peltier, you can contact the Pine County Sheriff's Office on 320-629 8380. Eric Smith. Eric Smith appeared to have it all. An experienced hunter with a 40 acre property in Cedar Bluff, Virginia, a loving family, two beautiful children, and a job that he adored. Eric worked as a mine foreman for the Consul Coal Company where he was popular and well liked. The father of two was admired for how seriously he took his role. 
He was cautious, level-headed, and would always carefully study any new safety rules, making sure to abide by them at all times. He never cut corners, earning him the respect of the 500 people he was in charge of. A week before his disappearance in October of 2013, Eric spent one week away from home on a business trip in Atlanta, Georgia. Upon his return, he was due to go back to work. However, he didn't show up. His wife called in for him, telling his employers that he was ill, possibly with the flu or pneumonia, and that he wouldn't be able to make it. Eric was absent from work for the next five days. He did not contact his work himself, nor did he check in with his team to see how things were at the mine. None of the people who worked under Eric heard from him during his absence. This was very out of character. As a part of his job, he was supposed to be on call at all times. On November 6th, Eric emailed his work to say that he was feeling better. He told them he was going hunting on Friday and that he'd report to work on Saturday, but the 42-year-old never returned. In fact, he was never heard from again. On November 8th, Eric's wife watched him leave the family home. He headed out on foot to check his tree stand less than one mile from his home on West Hurt Buggy Road. The Charlie Project has noted that Eric left in the early hours of the morning, but many news articles have stated he was last seen leaving the house at around 10 a.m. Either way, Eric never returned home. As an experienced hunter who was familiar with the area, he seemed like the least likely person to go missing in the wilderness. But when he didn't show up again that evening, his wife grew concerned. She contacted Eric's mother, who was at a local church, and they launched a search for the father of two with the help of the churchgoers. They also notified the local police department. Law enforcement did not wait around. They immediately launched an extensive search into Eric's sudden disappearance. Concern deepened for the father of two when, that night, the temperature dropped to minus three degrees Celsius. A helicopter, equipped with infrared equipment, was dispatched, along with several scent dogs, but all to no avail. According to the Deputy Search and Rescue Coordinator with the Virginia Department of Emergency Management, a trailing dog picked up several scents which led from the house, but these could have been days old. At least one of these trails led back to the family home. The following day, over 60 people gathered to assist the search efforts, including members of the fire department, search and rescue, Eric's co-workers, and his loved ones. Despite their best efforts, no sign of Eric could be found. The 42-year-old had left behind his phone and cigarettes, as well as his wallet, which was located inside his car. There is no conflicting information about how normal it was for Eric to leave his phone behind. While some news sources and armchair sleuths have deemed this as odd behavior, it's been pointed out that in 2013, the area had very poor mobile phone reception, especially in the wooded area in which Eric was headed to. It is also worth noting that according to several reports, it didn't seem that Eric actually intended on hunting that day. He was simply going to check on his tree stand. It's possible he didn't think he'd need his phone, as he didn't plan on venturing very far into the woods, or maybe he decided not to take it, as he would get no service anyway. Those in Eric's life don't believe that he would simply have walked out on them. He enjoyed his job, and he had no personal or work-related issues. His family and friends have stated their belief he would never abandon his children. One of his friends and co-workers said, he was not a man who would just leave. Another friend said in a letter to a local newspaper, bloodhounds were employed. The dogs barely entered the woods before circling back to Eric's home. Eric was not in those woods where he had supposedly went hunting. The mystery and circumstances of Eric's disappearance spiraled out of control after the search failed. No trace of Eric has ever been found. His clothing has never been located, and the muzzle-loading gun he took with him when he left the house has never turned up. In 2014, law enforcement received a tip that the 42-year-old was in the Door Road area of Cedar Bluff, but an extensive search of the area turned up nothing. In recent years, Eric's case has hit a standstill. 
online sleuths have proposed all sorts of theories. That he was accidentally shot by another hunter, that he fell into a sinkhole or cavern, or that he was attacked by illegal hunters or meth dealers. Others have suggested that because he took a gun and left everything else behind, perhaps Eric, for unknown reasons, wished to end his own life. Another, more sinister hypothesis has armchair detectives believing that Eric's wife was involved, since nobody actually heard from or spoke to Eric himself after he returned from his business trip. Authorities have said that tips in Eric's case are few and far between. If you have any information about his disappearance, you can contact the Cedar Bluff Police Department at 276-963-3975. And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. You can also support us on Patreon for early access to our monthly documentaries and the ability to vote on the cases we cover. Thank you for watching, stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.